Welcome. Welcome back to Rick Helps Real Estate Show today with our special guest, Mike Orr with the Cromford Report. Mike, welcome. Good to see you. Thanks a lot. Good to be this, here. This audience is very familiar with the Cromford Report as we look at it just about every day. And uh, it's kind of like drinking from a fire hose sometimes. You have so much data in there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. So it's fun. But I wanted to reach out um, in particular because you know, social media and everything is just uh, in the news, just on fire over this NAR ruling, which they couldn't have made it any more confusing when it comes to commissions. But the headlines say realtors agree to slash commissions. And, and I don't know where they got that. Um, right. And uh, so it's just utter nonsense. And it's going to be a very confusing summer. But out of that, um, you know, I've, I've had comments, that people get, well, you know, in, in the UK, which is where you're at now and you've moved right. back there is uh, well, they, they don't pay buyers commissions and they don't have buyers agents. What's, how do they transact over there? Uh, very differently. Um, buyers agents do exist, but they're rarely used. Uh, they're really there for people who've got uh, a lot of money and want to spend it wisely on an expensive property. Uh, most ordinary people don't use buyer's agents and I've never used a buyer's agent, for example. Um, they tend to only work in the south of the country where prices are higher and I live up north. But um, basically the buyer has a much tougher job in the UK. Uh, the, the balance is stacked much more in favour of the seller because they're represented by an agent and the buyer isn't. So the buyer has to be uh, very careful. Uh, the other major difference is we do not have anything like the legal environment. So the buyer is at their own risk. There is no obligation for the seller or their agent to tell you anything that is wrong with the property. You have to wow, no them. disclosure at all, huh? There's no obligated disclosure. You have, you have to ask the questions. You And of course, for a new buyer, they might not know what the questions are. The, uh, the main thing that you have on your side is what we call a solicitor. That's basically someone who's legally trained to write and agree contracts. And a good solicitor will tell you what you need to do to make sure that uh, you're not getting into something really bad. Uh, for example, they will advise you to get a survey done, not just for evaluation, but a full structural survey to tell you what might be wrong with the roof or the basement or whatever. However, that costs quite a lot of money and a lot of people say, well, I'll just take a risk. It looks well, okay to me. What, what, what does a solicitor usually run? What's that cost? Um, the, it, they charge by the hour like lawyers do. So uh, okay. if you've got a simple transaction, it won't be too expensive. If you've got a more complex one, it could run into many thousands of dollars. So, uh, and both sides have to have a solicitor basically to get the deal done. Um, so a lot of the closing fees as such will go to a solicitor instead of going to an agent or to a title company. We don't have title companies. We don't have title insurance. Um, there is, there is, uh, you can insure yourself against specific things. Uh, you know, something in the, um, property that uh, worries you, you can sometimes get a company to insure you against something bad happening, but it's, nobody has title insurance for the sole purpose of insuring good title. The good title is assumed because it's controlled by a single source that works for the government. Now, my understanding too, and you pointed out to me is it, and I saw uh, somebody interviewed uh, last week where when you're listing a house, um, there isn't a multiple listing service, but no. there's two, for lack of a better term, uh, web portals out there that you pay to advertise your listing. And you've well, got to shell out a lot of money for that, don't you, to get you, your listing in front of people? The, the seller doesn't pay. The selling agent pays. Selling agent they, pays. Okay. They yeah. will usually have an annual agreement with one or more of the portals. And there's more than two. There's probably nine. But the two big ones that are most known are Right Move and Zoopla. And if you don't advertise in one of those, you're not going to get very many uh, buyers. Um, whether you choose to advertise in both, obviously that's going to be more expensive. But uh, 
Uh, that's something that the basically the, la the larger agents negotiate their fees with those services, and they're always complaining about high, how high they are. The fact that to list one property is probably kind of cost you as much as you pay in dues to the MLS in Arizona. So, oh wow, it, it's it's quite an expensive uh, proposition. Now, so when 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 they list the home and the buyer wants to see it, does the buyer go? directly to the seller or directly to the agent they usually well, contact the selling agent and say i'd like to see it and the selling agent will perhaps arrange to go to the property themselves or perhaps call the seller themselves and say can you accommodate this person coming to your house at this time and i would say in my experience um probably about 60 percent of the times i've looked at a house uh, that that hasn't been an agent there the, the owner of the property showed it. And uh, so I don't know if my experience is typical. I've bought and sold about nine homes in my lifetime in the UK. And uh, they're, so that's not a huge sample. But um, it, the selling agent is not going to be able to cover every showing. And there's no yeah, other. <laughs> There are no buying agents to do the showing, so it, it falls to the person who's doing the selling to show the house. Yeah, if you've got three listings, I mean, you're just bouncing around like a ping pong ball. And, uh, you know, so in so here in the United States, as you're aware, uh, the ruling, the settlement, only $418 million. <laughs> I yeah. don't know where they're going to scrape up that money, <laughs> but uh, I think I read they make $22 million a year, so I don't know where they're going to get it. But no. they, it's weird, Mike. They, they said that we can't post a buyer's uh, agent commission on the multiple listing service, uh, but we can put it on our own website. That's pretty much else except the MLS. <laughs> yeah, everywhere except the MLS. And it's like, what? what uh, something just happened to my computer there. It went black for a moment. And uh, so we're back. Um, I, it's strange. I, I don't know what they've accomplished. I mean, they've gone from saying, well, we want commissions to be transparent. So a couple of years ago, they told us we had to have the buyer's agent commission listed on other portals like Zillow and, and Trulia, Realtor.com. And now they've gone the entire opposite way. So yeah. a buyer now, if if you want to get a, a commission as, a, as an agent taking buyers out, um, <clears throat> you have to have an agreement up front with them that says, I charge X amount of dollars, a percentage. Right. Um, if you're unable to pay that, uh, we will write contracts um, that ask for the seller to, to contribute. That just sounds really messy to me. It does to me too. And the other question is if, if a buyer is um, inexperienced and doesn't know how to get a buyer's agent or is looking at properties without one, and decides they want to book, who's going to write the contract if they don't have an agent? Well, uh, probably the listing agent, right? Well, that um, that is a bit strange uh, to me, at least. The listing agent writing a contract for the buyer, who is basically the opposition. <laughs> well, I think you'll see some concierge services kind of pop up. In other words, you know, I'll show you a house for 50 bucks. I'll, uh, I'll write a contract for 200 uh, yep. I'll negotiate your inspections for 300 stuff like that may happen. But I, the other thing that's rattling around this little brain of mine is say, I got a, a young couple that really, really wants this house and they, they can't afford to pay me a commission at all. I mean, it used to just be came out of the seller's proceeds. Um, the sellers are not going to mark the price of their house down. No. I mean, the, the thought that now that you're not paying a, buyer's commission out there is going to lower the cost of housing is just foolery. Um, so I think yeah. if, if, so if they come to me and they go, Rick, I really like this house. It's in Gilbert and it's everything we look for. And we write an offer that says they're going to pay two and a half percent commission or 1% or 2% uh, back to, to me to handle a transaction. And they say, no, well, the buyer's just going to kick me to the curb. Uh, and what if we get back to the days where there were 25 different offers for the same house? Maybe the seller is going to pick the one with the lowest commission. Exactly. It's exactly. 
in that sort of situation where you're having to so show 25 houses to get one purchase, you know, there's actually a lot of work involved for the buyer and their agent. More than well, you, yeah, you mentioned the cost of a, having a solicitor, you know, it's hourly. Well, you know, realtors don't get paid hourly. When you look at how many times you're in the car, how much gas you're spending, how much time you're on the phone, how many home searches that you're doing every morning. Um, you know, I'm not whining about, you know, how we earn our, our money, but you know, there's a lot involved in helping a buyer find a home. And I've, I've had buyers before just change their mind and say, well, yeah. Rick, we're, we're going with somebody else. And those agreements don't seem to be very binding. No. And you don't get the money until you succeed. Yeah. You have yeah, to put a lot so. of work in up front. And uh, so it's, it's going to, I think this is going to make quite a lot of changes and I'm not quite sure what all those changes are going to be yet. We'll have to wait and see how it works out. Uh, well, but it, does, it doesn't seem to make the situation for buyers better. It may make the situation for sellers better because they're going to keep a little more, bit more of the proceeds, but buyers are going to be in a disadvantage just like they are in the UK. Uh, definitely in the UK, a buyer is in a much more dangerous position than a seller is. It could go full circle once again, as buyers start getting burned and lawsuits start cropping up, they're going to yeah. have to say, well, we got to figure out how to get some fiduciary representation here. But I think, uh, I think for sellers, I mean, I, I think it lowers the buyer pool. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, you, and people are getting kind of funny with it and saying, well, you know, um, I'm just, I, I can't put anything on the MLS, but I'm going to put two and a half chocolate chip cookies on the countertop in the photos, you know, it shows yeah. that I'm paying. <laughs> so they'll, they'll have to figure I'm out sure a way that, to... that would be against the rules very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, there's, you know, you can have two trees in the front yard, whatever you, you know, yeah, they're just trees. Um, so, so something's going, I've got computer gremlins, but, um, so I think it's going to be a very, very confusing summer here. And I, and as I look around the world on commissions, um, every United States seemed to have had the best system and the most protection for buyers. And it seems like we're just kicking that to the curb here. And uh, um, I think summer is going to be very confusing because brokers are already calling each other now and go, how are you going to handle this? What are we right. going to do? Some agents are saying I'm getting out. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. it's so confusing. I don't, I don't know what to do. It's hard to get a buyer broker agreement signed anyway. And uh, so, say, you know, having bought, um, I think six houses in the US and six in the UK, that as a buyer, it's easier and less stressful in the US. And it's also faster. It, you know, it takes, it can take four to six months to get a transaction completed in the UK instead of one to two months. So, well, and then there's a lot of fallout then too. I mean, if you've got four to six months, and you know, it's, it's easier. There, there's more problems that can crop up that make you walk away from the deal. Yeah. Well, one of the key differences in the UK is there's no contract up front. So, you know, if I like a property and I make an offer, it's usually on the phone. And uh, then we instruct solicitors to start preparing a contract. I, that may take two months. Wow. So everything's up in the air. Nobody knows quite what we've agreed to, except for the price. Yeah, I think I'm buying a house. <laughs> right. We found a house, we think, well, and of course, there's nothing to really stop people backing out of transactions without penalty. That's the other big thing. Um, you know, the penalties and the time frames are spelled out in a contract in Arizona. You know, you know you've got a certain amount of time for inspections, and uh, you're kind of probably going to lose your earnest money if you start misbehaving. But in the UK, well, not, I wouldn't say the UK, in England and Wales, you can back out of the transaction until probably a week before the closing. In Scotland, it's different. You basically, once you've made an offer, it's binding on the buyer. But uh, everything's different in Scotland. Now, I toured Panama a few years ago, and uh, man, it's weird down there. There is no MLS, so homes are just listed on different realtor sites. Yeah. So you can see a home that's two hundred and five thousand dollars. Then you'll go to another site, same house, it's $215,000. And then you go to the seller and they go, oh, no, it's, it's $190,000. So 
they, while they don't have commissions, the agents go and they list your house and, uh, and then they tack on the difference between what the buyer wants, the seller wants and what they want to earn off of it. And there's no, no contracts. It's, it's all, um, you know, whoever can bring the buyer first and the sellers got it listed with several different real estate agents. And then on top of that, um, there's no financing. It's all seller financed. So it's, I, it's bizarre. I think pretty much every country is different from every other country when it comes to real estate. And, and you, uh, you don't have 30 year mortgages either. Uh, we don't use, well, we don't have 30 year fixed mortgages. We have things yeah. we call fixed mortgages, which means they're fixed for up to five years, but they typically will uh, then adjust for the remainder period. And they're not as long as 30 years usually. Um, How does that play out when we've had the year that we've had where rates climbed up? Uh, uh, it's very painful for people with existing mortgages. They tend to, as soon as the bank rate goes up, their mortgage payment goes up too. Uh, my personal mortgage payment doubled over the last 12 months. And uh, I think that's happened to a lot of people. Some people, it, you know, they've got a mortgage which goes up more slowly. There's limits to how much it increased at a time. But one of the reasons people in England are pretty unhappy with the government right now is because rates went up all in a hurry when Liz Truss became prime minister and started uh, making huge tax cuts that were unfunded, which caused bond rates to uh, dramatically change and therefore mortgage rates dramatically increased. And uh, she only lasted about four, uh, eight weeks as prime minister because of the outrage. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was very interesting to watch, you know. <laughs> well, they don't like me. I'm out. <laughs> she was told if she doesn't resign, that they're, they're going to have to get rid of her more forcefully. Uh, oh, she didn't want to go, but she's probably the most unpopular prime minister we've ever had, particularly with mortgage payers. Well, we don't get to do that here. Um, no. But uh, so so, do you see anything? I mean, they have we have a settlement, and it's got to be approved. Do you, do you think it's going to be uh, crafted a little differently before they actually tell us what to do? I don't, I don't know where this is going. I know that, uh, you know, a lot of people are saying that, you know, NAR is not helping us out at all and national right. association of realtors and they want out, but I can't get out of NAR if I'm in the Phoenix Emma, you know, with the association here, it's they're coupled. Um, it's it's basically thrown everything up in the air and uh, I'm not the person to tell you where it's all going to land. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, I can tell you about what exists in history, but forecasting the future is pretty dangerous. And it's yeah, I can't do it either. I, and and that, <laughs> that's what I like about your reports and your, and your observations on the Cromford report is that, you know, you don't make long-term projections. There are some trends we can look at and say, this may look like it, going yeah. here um, but uh, the, the great thing about real estate is the trends tend to last a nice long time so once you've spotted them they stay in place for quite a bit but also they do change at some point and um, the, what I try to do is get the first warning that something is different from last week you know get the yeah. turn point if you wait until the monthly reports come out you know you're going to be much later than someone who's watching it on a daily basis yeah, there are some things. It's very interesting, Mike. Last week, um, you know, I, I pull up uh, the uh, active listings um, uh, every every morning, and I put them in a ticker down below, and it usually ends up looking like like this. And uh, last Friday, I pulled out. We had 16,669 active listings, and then here comes Monday. I pull it up, and we had the exact same number. That's the first time in me doing this for three years on YouTube here, that the number did not change over the weekend. Mm -hmm. And I thought that is really odd, but it shows you how um, kind of stagnant and steady the market is, but you know, we're not crashing much to the chagrin of the, uh, what we call crash bros on here. Right. Uh, I'm not seeing any indication that that's happening, but I think, I think we're in for a wild ride this summer. Um, yeah. This is all supposed to take place in July. People are going to be trying to figure it out. I'm going to be watching it carefully. And uh, as I know you will, so it's going to be a, 
Uh, it's going to keep some of us up at night and some of us just go, well, eh, that's interesting. Let's, let's roll with that. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think the consequences are probably going to be, um, there were going to be lots of things we didn't expect that turn out to be not so good. So uh, in order to achieve some advantage uh, to the seller, there will be disadvantages dished out to lots of other people's, but you know, hopefully it will end up not disturbing the market too much. But uh, I think we've got a long way to go before all the pieces fall in place and we know exactly where we stand. Yeah, the world of unintended consequences. Well, yeah. Mike, thanks for taking the time for jumping in here and letting us know what things are going on across the pond. And uh, together we'll watch and see what happens here in Arizona. So, Yep. All the best to you and all your viewers. All right. Take care. Thanks again, Mike. Take care. Bye. Yeah.